Sunday. Good morning. This week on Capital City Sunday, a border battle in Washington. A bipartisan deal in the Senate falls apart, sending lawmakers scrambling. You know, this is one of these crazy issues where uh, it's for a couple decades, Congress has not done its job in fixing the laws at the border. Democratic Congressman Mark Pocan responds to Republican claims that President Joe Biden can use executive authority to secure the border. And I think it is increasingly sinking in for people that we are on track for a Biden-Trump rematch. And political, political expert Anthony Chergoski joins me. His takeaways from the latest Marquette Law School poll, the chaos in Congress, and the latest developments in Wisconsin's redistricting fight. This isn't a political issue. This is about protecting our children. And after the tragic murders of two Wisconsin children, lawmakers propose a new bill that they say would bring more missing children home safely. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Sarah Massler Donar. A bipartisan border deal and foreign aid package months in the making failed this past week after Republicans who demanded border security be part of it turned against it. The $118 billion bill would have given the Department of Homeland Security the authority to shut the border if migrant crossings rise above 5,000 a day within a given week or 8,500 in a single day. It also would have allowed immigration services to decide asylum cases at the border. Let's bring in Congressman Mark Pocan now. Welcome back to the show, Congressman. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So bipartisan bill has fallen apart in the Senate. House Speaker Johnson had said it was dead on arrival if it ever got to your chamber. So where does Congress go from here? How do you get both sides to the table on this issue? Uh, well, both sides came to the table on this issue, but Donald Trump decided he didn't like it. And therefore, the Republicans threw away everything they just asked for, which they were given a lot of it around the border. Um, you know, this is one of these crazy issues where uh, it's for a couple decades, Congress has not done its job in fixing the laws at the border. And right now, Congress won't give the president the money he needs at the border to process people, because if we were processing people properly, people who aren't here under the right uh, description of asylum would go back immediately, you know, you could, or much quicker than now. Some people are waiting seven years to go through the process right now, but the Republicans won't give the funding. I mean, this is a mess, and there was a solution that was moving towards something, worked out in a bipartisan way, but Donald Trump said very clearly he didn't want this to be solved during an election year. Republicans all rolled, and now we're back to the same mess that we've had for a while. So it's just a great example of how Washington sometimes doesn't work well. In this case, it's, it was Donald Trump affecting Washington and it made it collapse. So a couple members of Wisconsin's Republican congressional delegation have been, uh, talked about HR2 pushing that, which passed out of the House last May. Is there anything in that bill that can be salvaged? Obviously, it's up to the Senate, you know, not the House had already cleared that. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a piece of that can, that can move forward. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. This is the most no-brainer issue. It's going to have to be a bipartisan solution. We have a Democratic president, Democratic Senate, Republican House. Um, when I first got to Congress in 2013, there was such an animal. Got 68 votes in the Senate, which it's unheard of to get 68 bipartisan votes in the Senate. Uh, and then John Boehner never took it up in the House when he was Speaker. Um, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to the fundamentals that have protections to the borders, pathways, citizenship for aspiring Americans. I don't know if this plan was the perfect plan, but it was a bipartisan compromise that got tanked by Donald Trump, and uh, now we're, we're back to the starting gate. I think it's important to mention also when Donald Trump was president and he had a Republican Senate and a Republican House for two years, they didn't pass any new laws around the border. So this is a problem I think everyone can share uh, in the responsibility, uh, but right now in particular, what just got tanked uh, was definitely coming from the Republicans. In the absence of an agreement in Congress at this point, you know, some Republicans like Senator Ron Johnson are calling on President Biden to take executive action at the border. Should he do that? Um, well, if, if it was as easy as that, Donald Trump would have done that when he was president, right? So, um, and I love when people start saying, oh, that all happened in the last three years. I think we all remember this is longer than a three-year problem. It needs to happen from Congress. We've been, uh, the folks are remiss. You know, like I said, 2013 was probably the last real effort when there were 68 votes in the Senate. 
but we need to put those laws in place. The president could put a few Band-Aids on, and I think he's trying to figure out how to do that. He was hoping we would have done our jobs first. But at the end of the day, Congress has to fix the laws that currently uh, are in place. Asylum obviously is not the, the perfect only way for everyone who's coming in, but if we're also not gonna fund the very positions that could send people back who aren't here properly, it's gonna continue to have this mess that we have. And um, you know, I just think uh, at some point we have to rise above where Donald Trump in particular has been on this issue and realize it's gotta be done with Democrats and Republicans. No one party solution is gonna work. So let's move on to a different topic. As you know, the special counsel declined to file charges in President Biden's handling of classified documents. Now, in that report, he says Biden came across to investigators as, quote, a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Now, in the last Marquette Law School poll just came out this past week, 83 percent of voters perceive him as being too old to be president. Is Biden mentally up to the task for another four years. Yeah, so I, let me answer it in two ways. First of all, we have two older Americans running for president. We all know that they're only three and a half years apart. Both of them at times uh, have made misstatements, right? Sure, and let me <laughs> even come in with this. In the polls, just voters do not question former President Trump's sharpness as much as they do President Biden's. Yeah, see, and can't get away from that either. It's the perception. And that I find amazing, right? Because I think we've heard so many gaffes. Didn't he just get um, uh, Nikki Haley and Nancy Pelosi, two people who are completely opposite, mixed up? He thought Nikki Haley was involved on the insurrection on January 6th. That was Donald Trump, right? So if you want to talk about mental acuity, that's there. I can tell you, I have been in the Oval Office for one time, two and a quarter hours going over the Build Back Better agenda just a couple years ago. And for two and a quarter hours, 10 members of Congress were in there with the president, peppered him with questions. Every single question but one, he answered himself. Only one, he had to go to his staff. So he is absolutely there mentally. But is he an older American? Yeah, there's no question. And so is Donald Trump. And so we have a choice between someone who's taken that experience and got stuff done, like the infrastructure bill and lowering prescription drug costs and other things like Joe Biden, or you can have someone like Donald Trump who show me what he did as president, there's not much to do. Uh, I would much rather have that competent older American than the incompetent one. Are you finding it increasingly more difficult to defend President Biden as more uh, of these perceptions come out? You know, this is the, just the latest, you know, of course, and he's had some recent gaps. You talk about a couple of years ago, as folks get older, a couple of years can make a huge difference. Yeah, but I saw him as, and I've had conversations as recently as December, right? So I, I've seen no gap, uh, you know, happening uh, from there. I, I just think the reality is, uh, in politics, especially in Washington, you know, I just hit the median age in Congress. Um, that's kind of, you know, off for where we should be. I have colleagues in their 80s who are running for re-election right now. It's part of how Washington is, and some of it is experience, right? You want that. I also want the full mix of our demographics to be represented in Congress. I think we're overrepresented by millionaires. I think half of my colleagues are millionaires. But, you know, especially in that position, I don't think it's terrible that it's someone with a little more experience. I just want someone who's got experience to get things done and the Bipartisan um, uh, Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, reducing health care costs for us and energy costs, the Chips and Science Act, making things in the United States again, like computer chips, all those happened under Joe Biden's first two years. I want that rather than just more, you know, the hate and rhetoric that we got out of the Trump presidency. I want to talk about a uh, Wisconsin-based issue right mm -hmm. now. Um, let's talk redistricting. Yeah. It's the big conversation here in the Badger State. National Democrats have actually, you know, they've asked the state Supreme Court, we know this, to redraw congressional lines following the state yeah. Supreme Court overturning legislative maps. The court hasn't said if it'll take the case yet, but do you support this effort? Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone knows that, you know, we've got some of the most gerrymandered lines in in the country, in Wisconsin, uh, state legislative and congressional. I mean, just common sense. If we're a purple state and people win, you know, often with a less than 1% statewide, if we have eight congressional districts, that means you'd probably have four and four. We have two Democratic seats and six Republican seats. So clearly, I, I think those efforts would be good to be looked at to make sure that we don't have you know, that partisan gerrymandering going into a November election. What the court will do, I don't know. I know uh, even on our state maps, that's all in flux right now with uh, what could happen with the legislature and the governor. But, you know, I think just the common sense of if you're a purple 50-50 state, uh, the congressional maps probably should look more like four and four rather than two seats for Democrats and six for Republicans. Democratic Congressman Mark Pocan, thanks so much for joining the show. Yeah, thank you.